Hello, everybody. Welcome to week four of the August class, BC1-1808. Thank you to Kate for week three's reel. Um, always appreciate that. Hope you guys enjoyed the work because it was a lot of high quality work from all of you this week. So thank you uh, for submitting. Thank you, Kate, for um, putting that together in such a enjoyable presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it'd be awesome if you could do that one more time for week four. Um, but I'm sh I know that that's work and, and uh, I appreciate you doing that for us. So welcome everybody. Um, let's see, I believe I've got everything set up. I've had a couple issues, you know, in the last couple streams. T let me know if the audio, video, and frame rate is good. Because that will be a renewed victory for us. But I don't see any, I see audio. Confirmation of the audio. It sounds like it's, I think it's good. I think it's good. I'm going to trust that it's good. And yeah, so week four, um... I feel like I've been missing out a little bit because, because I've been out of the office the last two days, which means I haven't touched Blender for like five days, and I haven't been as plugged in regularly to the, to the um, class threads as much. Works good. Awesome. All green. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, I feel like I've been missing out a little bit. I spent all morning catching up in the class threads. Uh, realizing how much work was was done this week, and um, in particular the weekend, I feel like uh, I was checking up until like Thursday, Friday, and it didn't seem like that many submissions, and then they all kind of rolled in. Uh, a lot of them rolled in over the weekend, but um, anyway, so I feel a little out of touch. Spent all morning trying to catch up, and um, it's been a bit of a, a rush. So uh, I hope this I hope this stream goes well. I haven't been able to like prepare as much as I'd like, but. I have gone over it, and I'm uh, I'm excited for this week because the week four goal and purpose is to discuss the next steps as a modeler. Um, you know, how where do you go after this class? How do you continue pushing forward? Um, a lot of this stuff is mindset and cr you know creating habits for yourself, like finding inspiration, things like that. Not explicitly blender things, but but how to train your mind as an artist and and point yourself in a, in a direction that will keep you progressing, keep you learning, keep you excelling. And so that's what we're looking at this week. Um, but before we get into that, of course, we want to go into uh, submissions, homework submissions from last week, uh, my favorites in particular. And there were a lot of them. I, um, I feel like it's been really easy to, to grab a lot of submissions uh, this class, where I used to pick like two or three, I feel like. But um, anyway, these are the Primitive Sculpts, which are from N647, Wilco, uh, Wilco Wilbrink, Dragon Ice, and Mark DeBear. Uh, it's a pretty simple uh, exercise in concept and, um, and in appearance, but like I really appreciate people who go, go all out. And, and like, you know, I think I said last week that it's something that can't be perfected. Like you can't, I don't think a human could by hand sculpt a perfect cube, a perfect sphere, a perfect cone. But you know, you can go as far as you can take it and how much time you're willing to put into it and how much uh, how much effort you're willing to perfect it and polish it. And so these these people really did a good job in particular. And, and I like how tight you made the edges, how smooth you made the surfaces. I mean, Wilco, your sphere right here comes really, really close to like a perfect sphere, as close as I've ever seen um, just by looking at it, you know, it, it's it's really high quality. The sphere, the cubes are very very tight edged. I mean, uh, N six four seven. Like, I know we're just talking about a cube, but like that's pretty difficult to get it that straight, that sharp. Anyone who's done the exercise knows that that's difficult. So anyway, good job on those primitive exercises. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, I find that exercise very fun. I hope you you guys did as well. But uh, thanks for submitting those. All right, we've got some Melvins. Yukino Hataki, your Melvin sculpt was great. Now, I've enjoyed watching you particularly this month because um, as far as I know, you are a complete beginner that's that's able to sculpt something like this after a month of working with Blender, which is insane. I wish my sculpts after a week of, of working with computer graphics looked this well, looked this looks good. And um, so anyway, I... I I, I just wanted to tip my hat to you. You've been doing great. And I, this Melvin is very accurate to the artwork. And you just did a great job. So uh, Dragon Ice. I mean, as soon as I started collecting my favorites, I remembered your punk Melvin and went back and found it and was like, of course, this has to be in there. Very memorable interpretation of Melvin, giving him some 
some you know edgy edgy character uh you know the horns gesture i mean it's just a cool unique interpretation and i i like it it's, it's a high quality sculpt so uh good job dragon ice there with that melvin um curious your melvin sculpt now what i like about this one is and i put it in your feedback was that it makes me think of like a young like a baby melvin you know sort of like like the muppet babies how you take the uh I guess more mature version of the Muppets classic characters and make them baby form, you know, like young kid form. That's what this reminded me of. I don't know if it's called chibi or what, but like bigger head, smaller um, limbs, just gets this very cute type of Melvin interpretation. And I, and I really liked that. Um, so uh, good job. I'm not seeing that before. I've seen a lot of Melvin sculpts, but none that kind of capture that, that baby Melvin type vibe. Um, Miranda, I mean, of course your Jigglypuff had to make it in here because You've been working on that for several days, uh, maybe a week at least. Um, but, I mean, you've taken advice and criticism very well and applied what others have suggested. And it just turned out to be an awesome, very authentic Jigglypuff sculpture. Really great job. Um, and, I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't love Pokemon? So, like, you start doing Pokemon, you're guaranteed to have some, some fans. So, uh, overall, just incredible work with that sculpture. And... And then we've got Wilco Wilbrink's Turtle Monster, which I thought was, well, all of Wilco, all of your sculpts this week were very detailed, more so than the majority of them. I didn't really expect too much detail from this month, considering it's kind of an introductory beginner's type uh, assignment. But you are you're diligent enough to put that that exercise or that um, uh, effort and detail into your sculptures. So great job, this Turtle Monster. I love the style of him. He kind of reminds me of like, uh, was it... I mean, there's a couple, like, this reminds me of a couple characters, like, I think in the Super Mario movie, which is known to be a terrible movie, but, like, those henchmen had, like, enormous bodies and, like, small heads. That's what it reminded me of. I feel like I see this character in, like, a Ninja Turtles, you know, spinoff show or, or something to do with Ninja Turtles. Uh, you know, obviously it's a turtle, but I liked your your creature that you came up with and, um, and the level of detail, sculpting the wrinkles in the clothes, the, the fingernails, the individual fingers, like... All of it is a lot of work and, and very interesting character to, to pursue. So good job there. And uh, Kenneth Klassen, Kla Klassen, I believe. I might have misspelled your last name. I'm sorry about that. Um, but your orc sculpture. I mean, I, th I think you joined the class last week. So you, you missed the first two weeks. But you hit the ground running in week three and sculpted sculpted your brains out, frankly. Like this, this you know, orc creature with supercharged muscles, muscle structure, and uh, and something that I noticed, like the fact that you did individual toes and individual fingers, that is that is a slow sculpting process. And um, I always try and fast track that by like copying and pasting fingers and stuff in there. But anyway, that just shows how diligent you were to address all the details, despite how repetitive it would be to sculpt multiple toes at that level of detail. So good job. And um, I mean, overall, like muscle structure's good. Uh, you really went to town on that on this exercise. So excellent job, Kenneth. And I think you're here. Let's see. You're apologizing about the light and render. I'm not. I'm not sure why. Oh yeah, the lighting and render is fine. I mean, it, it could. I mean, maybe use some like ambient occlusion, um, some shadows. You know, like stuff like that. But um, overall, like that's it's fine. Like it it reads pretty well. So nothing to apologize about. <laughs> um, so Ken, since you're here, I believe I asked this in your in your thread, but I haven't checked for an answer. Are you completely new to Blender? Is 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 this uh, like your first time digital sculpting? That would be crazy if that's true. But I just wanted to ask because if so, you're like a prodigy. But um, excellent job, Kenneth, uh, for sure on this week's work. Um, now for our head sculpts, you got Jake Carosi's um, female head which turned out brilliantly. I love that you went for the hair. That was a very nice touch. All of all three of these were examples of, of doing the hair. It, you know, bald, the, the requirement, I guess, would just be bald. The hair is going beyond. But adding that hair really, really solidifies a sculpt, a, a, a bust as being human. You know, we don't see that many bald people, so it's kind of a disconnect if you don't have hair. But the fact that you guys went for it really solidifies, um, in some cases, like the gender, but also the uh, um, humanity of these of these heads. So really good job, Jake. Um, I also, your facial anatomy 
is is really solid. It, it stood out um, among um, among the group as having particularly good facial anatomy, and so wanted to give you a thumbs up for that. That can be it can be difficult. It, it is difficult. Not that it can be. It is definitely difficult to sculpt this anatomy in our faces uh, well and recognizably without error, so to speak. Like that's always the goal. Not that not that we we're getting there, but like. Um, it just turned out really, really well. It's very recognizable as a human, and um, that's worthy of commendation when you when you achieve that. So Matthew Ulray, similar to you, love the hair. Um, I love I love what I noticed mostly about yours, Matthew, is that your eyes and your nose and your mouth, but especially your eyes and nose, read really, really well. That that those areas are difficult, especially starting off when when modeling or sculpting. Um, it's hard to get the right depths of like the inside corner of the eye, the fact that that's pushed back pretty far, that's always uncomfortable to like, to sculpt initially and kind of realize about the human form. But um, you did that, you, you achieved very good eyelids, uh, like as a base structure, and then your nose as well. For some reason, I just highlighted the, the fact that those were achieved really, really well um, when it's often overlooked or, or not achieved at this stage of sculpting. So good job, Matthew. And then Pavel, I mean, you crushed yours with your self-portrait. Uh, anybody who's looked at, at your um, your avatar can tell that it's like very, very um, uh, similar to how you really look. And you went all out with a with like a, a Greek statue bust render, you know, just to put that final icing on the cake. So excellent job. I mean, if these are your first sculptures, it's just incredible that these are your first sculptures. But But even still, for beginners sculpting, like, Awesome work. All right. So, yeah, that's the homework. Thank you guys for submitting. Um, we had very little fall off from week two to week three. So you, a lot of you guys stuck with it. And uh, I think we had like 29 submissions on week two and then like 24 for week three. So that's very little fall off. So I'm glad that you guys are sticking around, pushing through to the end and, um, and getting the most out of this class. All right. So with that said... Let's talk about next steps as a modeler. What now? What do you do? We're, we're in the last week of this class, and, and after, after this is over, like how do you keep going? How do you maintain um, progress and development of yourself as a modeler? Well, let's see. Oh, I, I forgot that that faded in. Um, becoming a better modeler, practice. That is the key word. That is the unromantic... Um, non-desirable truth, I would say, of how we get better, how everyone gets better. You can't fast track practice and time. You just have to do it. You have to, you have to grind it out. You have to continue modeling, modeling one face, modeling another face, modeling a human body multiple times. Like you just have to practice and get very familiar with your workflow, with um, techniques, with with uh, awareness of what shapes are like, like human anatomy, for example. I know that that was asked about um, so like that is all in the realm of practicing. And so that's, that's a big focus for this week. I, I do have an assignment, but I'm not telling you specifically what to model. Um, it's up to you to figure out what to practice. So, but you have the tools at this point, you know, after the first three weeks, you have the tools for building what you want. You just need to do it. You know, um, I, I kind of see myself and any teacher as like showing you the door, but you have to walk through it. That's a movie quote, um, a gold star to anyone who tells me what that quote is from. Um, yeah, so like I feel like at this point you've seen the door, you've you've popped it open, but now you're gonna walk through. That is the next step. You walk through on your own, and so there is continued learning from this point. I'm not just gonna, you know, cut you loose and say, all right, you're done, go away. There's nothing more to learn. Just just start doing. Um, we always need to learn. We always need to be reminded. We always have skills to develop. And so specifically on CG Cookie, the modeling in Blender learning flow is the best place to go next after this class. And if we go over to CG Cookie, and that is in 3D Blender learning flows, these are, these are like paths for se watching courses sequentially. And the modeling in uh, Blender learning flow specifically uh, it starts with modeling one, you know, like kind of beginner introductory level. Then you go to modeling two, intermediate, into starting to get into advanced, and then modeling three is advanced level. And so, for this class, you have been exposed to modeling with, excuse me, modeling with modifiers, 
Fundamentals of Digital Sculpting and Blender Mesh Modeling Bootcamp. Um, so you have been exposed to all of those, but you've not been exposed to retopology. That is a core workflow and technique that m bridges sculpting with mesh modeling. So that'll get you started there because we use that technique throughout the rest of the courses regularly. Um, but then you go into intermediate level and you continue building hard surface things, a little more difficulty, even beyond modeling into like texturing and shading and lighting to to show you that you get more out of your models if you know how to do those things as well. Um, let's see, creating a jellyfish. This is strictly mesh modeling. I don't think there's any sculpting, but but it is with uh, but it or organic in nature, even though it is mesh modeling. And then sculpting a couple characters. Uh, this normal map modeling for games is is more of a technical kind of course for for game specific asp aspirers. Um, people who want to make games, like, check that out. But if you don't, you know, maybe you can avoid that one for now. But um, finally, we get into the advanced level. Okay, we're modeling a full-on post-apocalyptic vehicle. We're modeling, we're sculpting hard surface uh, weapon and retopologizing it, which is a pretty difficult task. Advanced level um, architectural visualization, modeling a sci-fi helmet. Uh, so this is the, this is where you go next. If you want to continue learning how to model, this is where you go. And uh, it should be laid out pretty intuitively, just course after course. So check that one out for continued learning uh, after this class. Or, well, this week too. Like, uh, I don't think I have any assigned courses this week except to just go and explore the learning flow. Let me see if I'm missing any questions real quick. The Matrix. I feel like that's at least my second quote from The Matrix this month. So I like the matrix and I need to come up with some more quotes. So good job. Yep. You guys are picking up on it. You guys are sharp. All right. I don't think I'm missing any questions. Sweet. All right. So that's continued learning. Now I did want to, uh, I, if I want to talk about specializing, even though this is misspelled, that makes two typos so far, I believe. Um, specializing is okay. Okay. So it would even maybe be my recommendation, you know, like, at this point, you've been, you spent a week mesh modeling and then you spent a week sculpting. So you should know by now which one maybe you like more or comes more intuitive, which one you want to explore, whether that's mesh modeling and, and that just clicked more naturally for you or sculpting was a wild ride and you want to continue doing that. I think it's, it's not a bad idea to specialize because you can, you know, mesh modeling by itself is a pretty big creative has a ton of creative potential and a lot of facets to it. Nice little pun, you know, for polygon modeling. But spend time doing just that and really explore uh, what you can do with mesh modeling, the techniques involved, being very familiar with mesh topology, what you can do with uh, triangles and faces and, um, and quads and like how they're smooth. There's a lot to learn in that realm. Um, so like, depending on how much time you spend with Blender, you know, if, you, if you're in Blender like every day, maybe spend a week mesh modeling and doing nothing but that, and then spend the next week sculpting, sort of like the class, if you do it at like a daily rate. If you do Blender like every weekend, then like spend a month doing mesh modeling, month doing sculpting, that kind of thing. Um, um, I mean, you, it's, I'm not, this is just a suggestion. I'm not saying that you can't do both simultaneously, but I, I just think it's maybe a good idea to really focus. Um, at least if it were me, that's kind of what I would do. Um, so your week four agenda, we demand a pose. We demand a pose. Let's see. If I recall, I'll scoot back a bit this way. So let me get the right angle of the camera. It's something like this, you know, strong, strong jawline, looking out into the distance, something like that. You have no idea how cool it feels to be sitting in my room, my wife in the other room, seeing me do that kind of stuff. It's a very cool feeling and I appreciate you making me do it. Um, all right, yeah, so week four agenda, pick your poison if you want, focus on mesh modeling, focus on sculpting, or you can do both um, if, you, if you prefer. I know we have some more uh, advanced, uh, intermediate and advanced people in here in this class, but um, that's what you're going to do this week. You're going to focus on one of them or both of them. You're going to focus on something and you're going to continue exploring what you can do with modeling. Um, 
And yeah, the homework is model and or sculpt something challenging this week. Try to tackle a character if you haven't done it, a vehicle, a detailed household object. Um, I know you've been dying to model your coffee maker. Everybody is. You know, whatever. Show me, show me what you've learned, right? Show me what you're capable of. That's, that's the challenge of the week. And the reason it's a challenge is because, again, that whole like, I'll show you the door and you gotta walk through it thing, I can, you can only follow instructions for so long. Ultimately, Blender is, is a creative tool. It's just a means to an end. And you have to be the creator and that's what makes it exciting and that's what makes it worth coming back and doing. So that's what I want you to do this week. I want you to be the creator you define what you want to create this week, what you want to model, and um, make it a challenge. You know, impress me, impress everybody else. Uh, practice, practice doing that thing, what you want to build. So that's the homework. Um, it's vague. You get to choose what subject you want to model. And uh, impress me. Impress me. That's the, that's the assignment. Question, do you watch a lot of tutorials as well, not necessarily Blender ones? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and honestly, no, I don't watch a lot of tutorials anymore. I, if I do watch a tutorial, it's because I've forgotten something like, uh, you know, if I, if I have to rig something real quick and I forget, wait, how does, how does the constraints work? Sometimes I watch my own tutorials where I go over that stuff, but um, a lot of times I'll just hop on YouTube and look for that specific thing, find, you know, hopefully just that little nugget of information as a reminder, typically. Um, I haven't... I haven't watched like a full on tutorial, like how to model a character in, in several years. I mean, once you get to a point, you don't, you don't really need that stuff anymore, unless you want to watch it for entertainment or to be exposed to like, uh, another artist workflow. Like what I have wanted to watch recently was blending, uh, uh, Gleb and eighties robot modeling course. I mean, we all know that they're incredible artists and I would love to just peek in at, at, at how they work. Um, but I haven't done that yet. You know, um, also, once you get to like, once you've been doing this for years, you, you, it's, it's definitely not that you're not learning anything new, but you can see shapes and you can think like, oh, I know how they did that. And I haven't done that before. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to work out that workflow myself. You, you need less, like how, how exactly did you do that? Does that make sense? Um, sorry, I feel like I'm going on a little bit, but no, I don't watch tutorials that often anymore. Um, not that I'm not learning stuff, I just don't don't learn that way necessarily. Um, I look older in my profile pic than I do live. That's interesting. <laughs> I wonder why that's the case. But okay, another question from Yukino. I checked topology. I heard that it's best to stay with quads, but for example, when you have spikes, how do you do that? Um, okay, that's a good question. Yeah, let me... Um, well, how about we jump into Blender real quick to answer that question? So, I mean, well, really, we don't need to jump into Blender. You can create a spike with all quads, but, but, you know, using triangles for a spike is okay, right? Because what a spike does, what a, what a um a star junction does. Let's see if we. I guess we can jump into Blender real quick to answer your question. We are gonna look at. Oh, I forgot. We are gonna look at Jigglypuff. Thank you. I meant to do this earlier when I talked about Miranda's thing. Um, but let me first talk about this spike situation. So if you want a cone to represent a spike, like this is obviously all triangles, okay? And that's okay um, because of the shape that we're forming, right? Like, wait, what am I doing? Um, since this comes to a point and we want this to look like a point, that is okay to leave as a... As a uh, star junction, which means you have one central vertex and a lot of edges coming out from it. That's okay. You know, the quad rule is, is less a rule and more a guideline. Um, I mean, I almost always let a triangle sneak in here and there with that, whatever I'm modeling. So, so don't see it as a rule, see it as a guideline. And if you have any more questions about that, I would love to be able to help, but hopefully that's a little, that's to the point and understandable enough. Request strike a pose, you guys. Um, question, I heard that there is more ways to do one thing, but one is usually the best. That's what Blender Guru said. Um, yeah, so are you asking me if, if I agree with that in general? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Depends on what the thing is, I guess. Um, 
you know, like, let, let's say, let's take my, uh, sculpting with a mouse versus sculpting with a pen. I believe that the added dynamic of pen sensitivity, pressure sensitivity, makes sculpting with a pen and tablet the superior choice. However, I also know that there are mouse sculptors out there who can do amazing things. And so when I see that, I'm not just going to say, well, you could have done it better with a, with a pen. Does that make sense? Like, I'm going to give the advice that a pen and tablet is best because that's been my experience and that makes logical, reasonable sense to me. But there's exceptions to every rule. Maybe it's as simple as that. The older I get, the more I realize how cliches and adages are like spot on truth. So you might hear me saying a lot of those. Um, anything else I'm missing? All right, yeah, so I did want to go over Miranda's sculpt with Jigglypuff because she had a question that I, that I answered in her class thread, but I thought would be helpful to everybody in case you missed that. And what she was asking about was she wanted to, I believe, if I recall correctly, enlarge the eyes and make them just generally bigger within within this central sphere of Jigglypuff. And, and she wanted to move, in order to make room for the eyes to grow, she needed to move the mouth down. And so I wanted to show her, my advice was do that in edit mode rather than in sculpt mode. And I wanted to show you real quick how that can be done. Because, you know, with Blender, it's really nice that we can dive into the into edit mode at any point and manipulate our object at the component level. Uh, when I used to be a ZBrush sculptor and you like couldn't do that, I don't know how it is now, but I'm pretty, but back then, like it was just pure sculpting. So if you ever wanted to make a change to the mesh, like, like, if it, if it would be easier to just rotate a bunch of vertices rather than the sculpture, you know, you'd have to export out to Maya, make that change and then go back to ZBrush. So with Blender, I remember thinking like, this is amazing. I can sculpt right there and then in a button, tab into edit mode, make my change and the sculpture is fine. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm gonna show now. We can tab into edit mode. And the first thing I wanna do is centralize my 3D cursor into the mass of the sphere because I mean, to illustrate the problem that we have with moving the mouth down is if I jump into sculpt mode, let's see, uh, clear mat. It looks like that's masked. Alt M. Oh, it is moving. I'm sorry. It just looked darker for some reason. Okay, so we're using the grab brush. And if I just move the mouth down, there's a couple problems that start to happen. Even though I'm using a big brush, like the form of the mouth has changed. You see it, it's shrunk a little bit. Um, it starts to get a little lopsided from the side. It starts to move straight down and it stops following the curvature of the sphere. So this is where the problems come in. And I think Miranda really, really wanted to maintain the mouth shape. I totally understand. Well, sometimes you just get a shape that's like perfect and you don't want to mess it up. And so in order to do that, we can tap into edit mode and center center our cursor to the middle of the Jigglypuff sphere mass. Shift S, cursor to selected. I believe you have the cursor turned off. Yeah, 3D cursor right there. And um, it's not quite in the center. If we rotate around now, whoops, this might... The only other, the thing to be, you know, uh, cognizant of is when you are in edit mode on a dynamic topology mesh, it can take a second to like update because it's so much geometry. You can see that that just happened. You know, it took a, it froze for a minute basically, but we don't want to use um, regular proportional editing. We want to use connected proportional editing. And, um, and I want to center that cursor a little bit better. I think manually I can do that by pushing it back in Y a little bit maybe over in X. Yeah, just get it kind of ballpark centered. All right, something like that. Now I want to select the mesh components in the mouth. And I can just select the back, since, since it's all connected mesh, I can select the back of the throat, hit Control plus and just grow that selection. So I'll take the entire mouth and then stop once I get just beyond the edge of the mouth, something like this, okay? Maybe even a little bit more. Although it starts growing less even once the geometry gets more dense. So I will leave it like this. We've got proportional editing enabled. I think I think maybe the sharp option is gonna be best. And then if I hit RX, 
Let's use, uh, let's actually change the pivot to be our 3D cursor, RX. All right, now we're starting to rotate the mouth. I'm gonna increase the fall off. All right, but if we look from the side as we rotate, we're rotating along the curvature. So it's not exactly a translate down as much as it is a rotate down. And that's just gonna maintain the mouth shape exactly the same and uh, gives us flexibility with the fall off, also maintains the shape of the sphere. So that's, that's what we're going for. And then to take it a step further, what we can do, you know, if we're not sure exactly how much we wanna move it down, let's add a shape key. This is in uh, mesh data, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, change key one to be a level of one. And with that selected, that means the, the key is on 100% so that when I rotate and make any mesh edits, let's rotate it like way down, something like this. We've uh, clearly we've messed up the eyes a little bit, but the mouth is maintained perfectly. And then you can control with a, with a slider how much that changes. So this, I like this for making cha proportional changes like this because I can dial in and say, okay, that's too much, but right there, 50%, 0. 0.5, that's the perfect amount. And then we can, uh, if we delete the shape key from the basis and then key one, now that's, uh, wait a minute, that's not right. Oh, I need to make a new shape from mix. Since we didn't use a level of one, I need to make a new shape and then delete everything except for key two. All right, now we have made that shape. We have tweaked it with a shape key and fine tuned it with a shape key and we're ready to continue sculpting. So anyway, that was what I wanted to, that was the advice I gave Miranda minus the shape key advice. Uh, and hopefully that might help you guys if you want to reproportion a character, move a limb, but maintain all of its detail 100%. Um, cool. All right. So back to what were we talking about? All right. We talked about the homework and what you're doing this week. Uh, question. Do you have the Neo site? <laughs> do you see objects on the street and immediately envision its wireframe? You know, that would make sense given how much I've referenced the matrix. Um, but I don't actually, I do. Usually it happens when I'm bored. You know, like I'll, I'll be, this is, that sounds bad, but like I'll talk to somebody and if I've somewhat lost interest in the conversation or if they're going on a little too long, like I'll start to think about like how their face is like structured and moving and how, how all of that goes together and wireframe is part of it because obviously I'm going to translate that into computer graphics and what I would do to achieve that with computer graphics. So it's not exactly the Neo site in like, I can't turn it off. That's what I feel like Neo can't turn it off once he's been there. But I definitely do see a lot of the world through a computer graphics lens. And less so with modeling, uh, more so with lighting and shading. I mean, that it, there, the world is so informative about translucence, color, shadows, light. It's, it's so much fun to see the world that way. But um, all the time I'm seeing the world with those lenses for sure. Questions. What's the best way to pose a sculpt when sculpting uh, a T or A pose? So... Uh, well, what I just shared about edit mode, like that's a good way. It's kind of like uh, ZBrush's, um, what do you call it? They used to call it transpose mode. That's what it's called. Um, and where, you know, like I do that in edit mode where you can use proportional editing. You can put your cursor at the center of the arm or the shoulder, you know, and like move it down. That's a good way to do it. But honestly, I like to get my character into the right pose ahead of time. Like I'll, I'll use the skin modifier to create a character in T-Pose and then start sculpting that detail. But let me see, if I go back to, when I did the the um, stylized character class, I did end up posing my character. Um, yeah, and I went over that. Let me see if I can find that real quick. If you're interested, past events, and I think this was in March maybe. Yeah, okay, week four. So. It was right here, week three production friendly character models. If you want to watch that stream, I go over how I posed. I, I basically sculpted a character in pose and then needed to depose it, like take it to a neutral state. And um, you might find that helpful. Question, does this trick for Jigglypuff work for any type of sculpture? Yeah, it totally works for, you know, 
it works for Jigglypuff in this situation because she was a sphere. She is a sphere, and like it made sense rather than to move the mouth down directly, it made more sense to rotate it around the center of mass. But yeah, like uh, there's there's several situations where that where you would want to move objects, you would want to move parts of your sculpture that way. So I use it a lot um, whenever I sculpt. Question: Is there a course on shape keys on CG Cookie? I don't know if it's on, if it's in our library, but years ago I did make a course. Let me see. Shape keys. I did make a. Okay, it must not be here. Is it on YouTube? It's this one. So this is. Uh, Non-destructive modeling with shape keys. Here's this guy. We love this guy, right? Um, so in this video, I, I should go over a couple instances where I use shape keys for, for uh, what, what am I trying to say? For like utilitarian utilitarian purposes, you can use it as a as a very powerful utility whenever you're modeling. One of them being like if you work professionally, and people and your your client. No, yeah, your client asks for like the arms to be shrunk or, or your mouth to be moved down. Do that change in a shape key and you can show them the spectrum in between and maybe they'll choose, okay, not fully, but 75% of that, that change. And you can do that really easily. Um, so anyway, look up that video for shape key utility instruction. Um, oh boy, I sure need to join Udemy. Oh, that ad, they just, uh, I don't need to go on about it. I've spoken my piece about it. Um, anything else I'm missing? I did a search for shape keys and five courses tutorial showed up. Okay, so I answered that one. Question, does your modeling change from beginning, from the beginning if you intend on rigging and animating it versus if you intend on just making an inanimate object? Yes, for sure. If you're just, okay, if you're just modeling for an inanimate object, that is very common right if you go to if you go find sculptures online digital sculptures like people often make toys you know that's a, that's an example where they're not ever going to be animated they're just statues that you can 3d print but in that case the topology does not matter it can be complete trash triangle triangulated topology and that's fine um but if you are going to animate and rig your character the topology does matter a lot and we teach that, we teach, we've taught that a lot. Let me see if, uh, if I can point you real quick to a course where that's, where that is uh, taught very practically. Uh, one of them is gonna be immediately this introduction to character modeling. This is a great course where we, where Jonathan Williamson teaches like how to create, a, how to sculpt a character and then create it and then convert it to an animation friendly mesh. Uh, this sculpting a, a Wrangler game character is only sculpting. The intention is to make is to now retopologize it, but we haven't made that course yet. Um, and then also this modeling a realistic character with a blender. This goes over uh, sculpting and then modeling for animation as well. So does creature modeling. That's typically what we teach. We often assume that you want to be able to animate your characters, but check out those courses if you're interested in that. Um, but yeah, you do approach them differently. It, yeah, yeah. Can uh, question when sculpting a non-symmetrical pose, do you sculpt the head in pose and just do your best to make it symmetrical, or do you sculpt the head separately, uh, symmetrically, and then place it in the pose and edit it further from there? Yeah, that both of those are, are options. Um, I personally am very spoiled by symmetrical sculpting, symmetrical modeling in general, um, and so I try to take advantage of symmetry whenever possible. Uh, another live stream I did coming up on a year ago was back in October, I believe. It was a goblin character. Let's see, where was that? October, yeah. Goblin sculpting for Halloween episode four. So go look at the goblin sculpt live streams because we actually found a cool technique for, for sculpting symmetrically on an asymmetrical model. Um, I'm trying to remember which one that was in. I'm not gonna be able to look to notice just by looking at it, but uh, anyway, in this in this stream series, we did go over that concept, and um, you know, 
if you mention the head specifically, like often I will sculpt that symmetrically and then leave it as a separate mesh and then sculpt, you know, the torso around it. Just wherever you can isolate objects, isolate pieces of a sculpture to make them symmetrical. I mean, I just think that's kind of a no-brainer. Try and do that because it's very difficult to sculpt symmetrically by hand. Um, your drawings would look great in 3D. Let's see here. Okay, I think that's it for the question so far. <laughs> Awesome. Um, okay, we've gone over the homework. We've talked about the agenda for the for the week. Uh, does anyone have any questions on the homework? Is it pretty straightforward? I know. I, I guess I feel like I need to clear or offer that ability to to clarify because I think I confuse people unnecessarily in week three by switching up the assignment. Um, but I apologize for that. But yeah, let me know if you have any questions about the homework. Um, and then closing thoughts. All right, so these are pretty important mindset things to be aware of. Number one is inspiration. As you continue to model and, and become, develop yourself a better artist, a better modeler, you know, dot, 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 whatever you want to become with computer graphics, you need to have a steady inflow of, of uh, inspiration, right? Like at a daily level, um, that is just crucial to continue pushing yourself forward. If you're just by yourself in your own head, this is, this is what I describe early on in my like artistic journey is, um, you know, I might be inspired by one thing and like, and, and, and nothing else for, for months at a time. And I would just continually often draw that one thing over and over and over. And I got very good at that one thing, but like it got boring and I, and I, and I wasn't ever creating something new. I was just, I, I, I didn't have a, I didn't expose myself to a lot of, of things that could inspire me. So I had to learn to do that over time. And so I want to share that that's very important and, and, uh, and, and then offer like what my inspiration kind of daily routine is like. Um, well, well, first as a CG cookie member, we have a gallery, of course. So c community, uh, gallery, this is a great place to look at what your fellow CG cookie members are doing. Um, and a lot of good work in there. If you haven't seen, if you haven't seen the, uh, the anime explosion example from, uh, Cody Winchester, this thing is brilliant. Like, this is one of those pieces recently that was like, what a genius, what an awesome technique. I can't wait to use this in a project kind of inspiration. Uh, but yeah, our gallery uh, projects here are regularly updated. You know, um, all of you guys are submitting stuff generally. Uh, you can check out staff picks, which have our like seal of approval as like particularly noteworthy, uh, full of great blender and uh, well, also like Photoshop illustrations. Um, but yeah, if you want to be inspired by Blender stuff, especially, you can do that. And um, yeah, so check there. Also, where I like to go is ArtStation. So ArtStation is arguably the leading computer graphics portfolio community where all of the attention is on artwork. And and you're not going to find better artists than than in here okay so i try and visit this regularly um you see everything from really talented uh like indie artists so to speak just people doing it for the love of doing it you also see like professional work here transformers the last night apparently this is i don't know something to do with that movie whether it was concept art whatever um so you get the highest level of professional artwork in here uh i mean you can't come here and not be inspired but but make sure you turn into inspiration and not intimidation. That can be a problem too. But ArtStation, check it out. Uh, we even see Blender artists pop up here from time to time. But checking this daily keeps me habitually inspired to try new things, to learn little tidbits of information. Like, uh, let's see, if I just, you know, if I look at this hair, for example, that's something I always know that I can improve on. Like, I can, I can just consider, like, wow, okay, so the pattern of these hair follicles, like, this is how they had them fall. And you can see that it's, I believe, with game, I believe this is probably a card system. Yeah, so here we can see they usually provide, like, wireframes or additional images. So I can see, like, how they uh, constructed their wireframe. Um, just right there, like, I learned something. You know, like, I haven't approached it that way. Here we've got bigger cards, we've got thinner cards. You know, this is the kind of daily thing that I, I spend... I don't know, a grand total of probably like 
20 minutes to an hour somewhere, depending on how how much stuff catches my eye or how busy I am doing other stuff. But um, keep yourself inspired. That's going to keep you progressing. And then in addition to ArtStation, I use Pinterest a lot. It started as just collecting all of my images that inspire me and uh, things that I want to reference later. So I've got all these collections of like, you know, this is one of the newer ones, so there's only one image in there right now, but composition, the idea of framing a still frame or, or an animated shot is very important and like gathering in, uh, uh, examples that do that really well. So I can go back and reference them. This is from the, the stylized character class. Uh, mech stuff, I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't like mech, mech things and aspire to model something mech one day? Uh, general inspiration here. I've, this is a specific project. The the link from Legend of Zelda. Like I really I love that series and I want to create a image to like pay homage to it. And so this is a collection of a hundred, almost a hundred pins that I want to inspire that project. So I, I do it either by topic, um, you know, sculpture in general, top quality sculpture, sculptors, lighting, um, or project centric. I've got a couple of those as well. And this is a great place to collect those. It's just very intuitive. You know, with the, P the Pinterest plugin, like I can be on ArtStation. Let me go back there. And if I love this image, you know, you can, you can right click on it or they actually offer the save option and I can just save it directly to one of my pins. It's very easy. It's, it's integrated very well across the internet. Um, but also the, the thing about Pinterest is once you start collecting stuff, you know, it's smart about recognizing what inspires you. So this is my Pinterest homepage. And I come here now, usually after ArtStation, it usually goes ArtStation and then Pinterest, where I start seeing, you know, artwork illustrations that I've not seen before that I can save and, and, and remember later. So I come here and just generally like glance through and see what inspires me. It's, it's um, yeah, just part of my regular habit. I don't know how much I can beat that dead horse, but like if you're not inspired, if you're not like being uh, motivated by other artists, but artists better than you, or just different art styles, different sculpture styles. Like if you're not being influenced by those things, you're just gonna feel very stagnant and you're not gonna, you're not gonna go anywhere fast. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, make it part of your habit to, to be inspired this way. Let me see if I have any questions. Do, 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 do. That hair is so nice, uh, mesh pulling or, let's see. I think you're asking if, if it's like mesh pu pulling and pushing or if it's sculpted. I would say that it's pro it's not sculpted, the hair example that I showed. I think it's, it's, uh, it's mesh modeled hair, basically, with a texture plane. Um, yeah, okay, Tebow, awesome. Pinterest is, is indeed great. Our, our station makes me sad. Okay, so that's an example of like, don't be intimidated by art station. Um, treat it as inspiration. I mean, maybe it, it comes, it, you know, like everyone has has things to learn and places to, to level up, all of us. So we're just at different parts of that journey. Understand that, you know, it's the truth and, and be okay with it. Like, I mean, I've been doing this for what? Well over 10 years and it's, and like I'm learning stuff all the time, so. Um, improving as an artist is just part of it. Don't be intimidated. Be inspired. <laughs> uh, question, is Evie a good choice for last week? Uh, for the last week, there will be three of them. Slightly different Pokemon. Different maybe on extra Pokemon. Would it cost a point if they stay in basic pose? No, not at all. Like, um, if you model a few Pokemon and they're all in neutral pose, that's fine. Um... By now, I should be able to, I mean, we should have a good feel for each other that I'll know when you're challenging yourself and when maybe you're not challenging yourself. So within that rule, like operate on that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, when will there be critiques again? It's interesting that you ask this. So I have one slot open in in September that uh, for a live stream that I have not scheduled currently. Maybe I'll make that one a critique and then get a thread started so you can, so people can start submitting. But um, I also was wondering like if it would be practical to in, in upcoming classes to, to stream like this on Tuesday 
and then maybe stream on Thursday as like just a critique session. You know, I don't, I'm not like teaching anything. I'm not making a presentation or anything like that, but we just jump online. And if you want me to critique your artwork or your homework at that point in the week, just submit it, you know, send me a link through the chat or something like that. Um, so anyway, I guess your question may reminded me that I am th thinking if it would be practical to incorporate critiques into the class format. Um, but anyway, I also might very well make a critique stream for September, the one open slot towards the end of September. Um, question. So we slowly started with modeling, then we're going to be better. And what next? So we slowly starting, we're slowly starting with modeling and then we're going to be better. And what next? Okay. Fair question. Yeah. So where do you go? I guess really what I think you're asking is like, where do you go after modeling? For me, that was a very real thing that I needed to eclipse. I needed to go beyond modeling because gray models by themselves are good, but they're not 100% satisfying. So from there, um, I guess if you're asking, on, well, from there, you know, you want to learn texturing, you want to learn shading, you want to learn lighting, rigging, animation. There's several big topics that you want to learn. And um, if you want a crash course on the entire pipeline, the biggest course I've ever made is I think what what you want to watch um, and it is let's see I never remember where it's at I just need to search for it if you search for Piero that's the name of this bird and short film character production this is the largest course I've ever made at like 49 videos something like that it's massive but I literally go from scratch and create this bird character um, I model him, I texture him, I shade him, rig him, and animate him for a final product. So that, if you want to know what comes next, look at this course. And then that will tip you off as to the other things that you can learn. I think that the idea of offering critique for homeworks uh, is amazing addition to the class. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm going to consider how to... How to, how to make that a reality, because I, I think that would be a good addition as well. Critiques every Thursday and Friday on Cartoon Network. <laughs> okay, cool. So we've talked about inspiration, and there's one more closing thought I had. Okay, burnout. This is cropped up in, in our class threads for a couple people, and burnout is a very real issue for blender artists, for, for hobbyists, for creatives. Uh, but especially in the Blender computer graphics world, I think it's the type of interest that can that can take you down that rabbit hole very quickly. And you can do a lot of computer graphics work very fast, spend a lot of time in a, spend a lot of hours in a short amount of time um, doing that work. And anyway, we've seen people, uh, I think Aaron, you were one of them who, you've been doing Blender stuff like at a daily rate for for weeks, I believe, if not like a month or two. And you're starting to to feel weary from that, okay? Um, first of all, like, I mean, I want, I, I guess you need to watch out for burnout because that passion I share with you, and and we've got to like foster that. We've got to nurture it, and do any doing too much of any good thing is going to be a bad thing. So we've got to learn. You've got to learn how to take breaks, how to step away from your computer, how to find something else to entertain yourself for a while, how to how to relax recuperate, recharge, and then come back with fresh, with fresh computer graphics energy. So watch out for burnout. You can do this stuff too fast and just be aware of that. Um, I've seen way too many people burn out, do stuff too quickly, burn out, and then never come back to it. I've been in that situation myself. There have been hobbies and other interests I have that I just indulge 200% and then I never want to see it again after, after I do that. So do you know it's just just take care of yourself like don't burn out that's pretty much it yeah it's everywhere too not just computer graphics as a general principle we've got to learn how to manage our interests and our time how to foster our passions and keep them alive we do need to do that awesome aaron you're saying almost uh, entirely since February, taken a week or two worth off since. Yeah. I mean, you like, it's clear in your work, man. You're doing awesome work. 
very impressive work and, and high quantities of work that, I mean, yeah, we, I think we all kind of sensed it when you said, I'm getting tired that we're like, yeah, you, you should be tired. You're doing a lot. So just watch out for that. Find the balance. Absolutely. Um, I've spent, can I've, you're saying I've spent a large portion of my life burning out, learn the lessons the hard way. I mean, sometimes that that's all you can do. Advice doesn't, advice isn't enough by itself. So yeah, um, sometimes you do have to learn the hard way, but um, cool. All right. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of it. Um, don't be afraid to take breaks. That's going to be a healthy thing. I believe that's it for the presentation. All right. So yeah, that, uh, some of these topics, most of them were like mindset, how to, how to stay inspired, how to get in the habit of being inspired, how to avoid burnout, foster your passion and keep it progressing and at, at a healthy rate. Um, also talked about challenging yourself and this week specifically when you have, you know, like when we are, when we creatives are progressing and doing well, like we're depending on ourselves. We are, we are, we are our entire creative um, direction ourselves, right? That was a really s silly way to say that. We are the only ones that can create. No one else can make you create. No one else can control your creativity. That's just you. So if you, you are the, the key factor in, in creativity. Um, so that's kind of the point of this week. I want you to be your own creative engine, your own creative fuel, and I want you to create something. All right. That's going to be important for continuing to do computer graphics and getting better. Um, yeah, so we've talked about mindset stuff. So for the demo, the next hour, I wanted to do my own thing, you know, in this realm and something that I'm trying to learn to do better is gestural sculpting. Um, gestural sculpting is the idea of like sketching a 3D form as quickly as possible. And that's what I'm going to be doing the, during the demonstration. I, I want to record a tutorial about it fairly soon, but um, I figured I could do that uh, for the demonstration so you guys can, I don't know, see what I'm doing to benefit, to develop myself further and, um, and how to become a better modeler through gestural sculpting. Uh, I saw a question roll in. Can you show the level of modeling you have to achieve to be noticed to get a job at a studio? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go to ArtStation for that because that's typically the best. But um, to get noticed by a studio, I mean, obviously, if you're doing, if you're doing this level of character work, right? So you can tell that this is a 3D model. There's sculpting involved. There's hair involved. Render quality is really nice. The topology looks very clean. Like this is going to get noticed. If if you're trying to get noticed, this is this is the level to get noticed at. Uh, but this involves multiple things. Let's look for modeling specifically. All right, so here's a sculpture. I'm sure that this is a pure sculpture and not. Yeah, I mean this looks like a ZBrush screenshot. So I'm sure that this is not retopologized. But there's style in this sculpture. It's it's just a, it's just a model. So like if they're trying to get noticed and get hired, like what they're showcasing here is their ability to shape things very well, their ability to create a style that's um, distinguishing, their ability to create fantasy creatures. Like these are the, the criteria that are getting noticed that, that, are, that they're showcasing in this image. And they're, I mean, I would definitely find this noteworthy if I was, a, if I was an employer. Um, Let's see. I mean, you know, like levels of detail is something like, uh, I mean, for this, for this weapon, for example, like there's no, there's, he spared, he or she spared no expense in this modeling. Uh, like every details model, every, every nook and cranny of this weapon is addressed and it looks very well. It looks very good. So like, this is going to be noticed, I feel like, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard. I don't know if, if when people ask that question, I don't know if they're asking like, what's the minimum I can do to get noticed? Like what's the, the least my model has to, what least quality my model has to be to get noticed? That's not really the question that's going to lead to success. You know, like see this stuff. I mean, let, let's see, 3D character artists, see if we can find if they're working anywhere. Doesn't look like it. Or they don't at least say it like explicitly, but um, often you'll find that people have like, you'll click on this and they are guns and cappuccinos. All right. This example isn't really working out, but often they put 
in their description, like I am a modeler at EA or I'm a modeler at, at a motion picture company, you know? So like you can see, oh, well, that's your skill level and you're obviously working professionally. Um, I feel like I'm doing a bad job answering this question, but, but the question is not to ask what's the least I can do, but how, how can I, what's the most I can do, you know? Um, that's, that's a better question. Let's see. Question there, anything on making environment environmental scenes? That is currently something that we're working on. Um, Jonathan Lampell is, is, has been working on a huge course actually about creating sci-fi environments. And um, um, so that's something that he's working on like to address the environment scene. Now you might be asking about nature and uh, let's see, I can point you to another one of his courses. Where is it? Oh wait, there is one. This is um, building a modular game asset. This is about the environment specifically. If you want to model that kind of thing, it's not nature, but uh, it is an environment and you can learn some things, some techniques from there. Uh, also, let's see, he had a grass like nature type course. Was it this? No, it wasn't this one. Um, sorry, one second. Let me find by author Jonathan Lampell. Where is it? Huh, I'm blinking. He had a course about creating plants and stuff like that. But I'm not finding it. That's bizarre. I might have to get back to you on that. That is currently a, like, creating natural environments is a bit of a, a hole in, like, the curriculum currently. Um, but, uh, yeah, we need to get on that, frankly. Yeah, so quite nameless. A lot of girls, if you're talking about, like, on uh, art station and stuff, that is true, and they don't have a, uh, they don't have a great filter for kind of, you see a lot of that. Um, that's maybe a whole other conversation about how often women are portrayed in computer graphics, but um, I try to not notice, not, not focus on that stuff. Um, I know that, let's see, I know that Blizzard, for example, notices people who showcase a similar style to their games. Also very good strategy. If you want to be hired at like Blizzard, for example, and you create World of, World of Warcraft style artwork, they're going to notice that. And if it's really good, they're definitely going to notice that kind of thing. That's going to make you stand out and be very hireable to them. Um, you know, you wouldn't apply to Pixar with like a super realistic visual effects reel, right? Um, I, I don't know. Maybe this topic, I feel like we... I feel like we've talked about this. I'm blanking right right away like where we talked about this a lot, whether it's through answering people's questions, um, articles and stuff like that. But maybe we should do another stream about how to be hired at a studio. Um, I mean, let me ask this question to you guys. Press one in the chat if you are determined to be hired professionally as a computer graphics artist. Press one if you're determined to be hired that way. That's your goal. You want to make a career out of this. And press two if, if you're not. If you're doing it as a hobby, if you're doing it just because you have fun with it. Um, but you really don't have any determination to, to be a professional. I'm curious what, what you guys, what your thoughts are on that. Um, all right, we talked about burnout. Okay, I think we're ready to start on the... I'm seeing some ones, only one so far. One? I'll be honest, I did not expect that many ones. And it doesn't matter, like, not, I'm not talking about just a professional modeler, but anything, anything that you want to, uh, if you want to be an animator, rigger, whatever, if you want to be professional. One and two, okay. That's way more ones than I thought. <laughs> I wonder what three is. 
one or on my own. That's that's totally true too. Like I, I'm not. I don't mean just at a studio. If you want to be a professional freelancer, that counts as a one. Okay, so there's. I feel like there's actually more ones than anything else. Interesting. Liquid in the stream spotted. Sorry, I needed a sip of water. Okay. Okay. Well, sometimes I wonder if we lean too hard on trying to like force you guys to like take this seriously and become a professional. Whereas like I, I, sometimes the data would suggest that more, most people want to just do this for fun. So anyway, that's interesting feedback. Um, I don't think that I've missed any questions. I was just settling down, getting relaxed in my chair because I was going to start sculpting. But don't don't hesitate to ask more questions. Um, that's what I'm here for. But with that said, but more like a freelancer. So there's actually most of you want to be professional at some level. That's cool. Um, I mean, you're like you're like us. We at CG Cookie, we very much aspire to teach a professional level curriculum. So um, this is the this is a good place to be. All right, let's. Uh, okay, question from Wouldn't Blizzard be interested in with someone who who is using Maya or 3ds Max more than Blender? I remember I was doing the job search and mostly Maya and 3D were musts. So the way that I will answer that question is this: if you're if you're real and your portfolio is amazing, Blizzard thinks it's amazing. The quality of work is just next level. They want to hire you because of that. And then if they see that that work was done with Blender, and they don't hire you because of that, I just can't imagine that being true, frankly, because what's actually what's actually important is the quality of work that you do, not what software you use. So I, I personally would have no issue whatsoever with applying to a blizzard. Like if I wanted to work for them, really spending uh, several months, like developing high quality assets, all with blender. I wouldn't mind doing that, submitting a reel all made with blender. I, I cannot imagine they would not choose you because of that software. I mean, take Pixar, for example, like you cannot use their software outside of Pixar. So they're only hiring people based on their artwork. They know what's up. They know that that's what's important. You can teach anybody to use the tools. You cannot teach anybody to be the artist. And I imagine all the top tier, all the top tier studios are like that. Having said that, it would be a, a wise strategy to maybe get the student version of Maya, student version of 3D Studio Max, because I think you can get a free educational version and practice with those. I don't know, I mean, maybe do a project. I don't know if they allow that with their educational stuff for you to use it on a reel, but like get some experience with those just so that it's not, you can put on your reel, or put on your resume that you know how to use those apps. Um, but without a doubt, like what's important is your ability to, uh, to create impressive imagery um that's more important than the software um victor navone was hired by pixar based on animations he made in animation in animation master is that a software um yeah exactly okay so yeah blender guru uh had an interview where they affirmed this idea. Question, if is this allowed? My head, I'm sculpting. What points are good and needs more attention? For example, I find the mouth strange, but can't get it good. I wonder how or what I do wrong. Um, Yukino, it sounds like you, you maybe need a critique. So maybe I will go in, um, maybe if you can remind me, um, Yukino, in your, in your class thread, Go ahead and post there, ask me and, and mention me and say, can I get a critique on my head? And I'll go in there and draw some notes and stuff to hopefully help you out. But, uh, but like generally, you know, uh, how to get better, more time practicing the face, like really study from every angle what's happening with the face. Some things that I know people miss is like 
the inside of the mouth. This corner of the mouth is very easy to to uh, to leave flat. It's actually like dips in quite a lot right here. So people people don't see that. People don't really get the ocular, the eye region very well. I don't know. I'm giving you generic advice, but if I look at your head sculpt and give you a specific critique, maybe that'll be more helpful. But uh, if you can remind me in your thread to do that, I will. You can teach anybody to be an art. You can teach anybody to be an artist. Um, okay, yeah, I think I think you can. I think you can. You can. I think you can definitely teach everybody. To, it's easier to teach people to use the tools than it is to use than to be an artist. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know if we're disagreeing, Pavel. But uh, doesn't Pixar use Maya now? I don't know what they use, honestly. Uh, they have their own animation software. I know that it's called, uh, is it Puppeteer or something? I, I can't remember, but, uh, they might use Maya now. I'm not sure. It just becomes increasingly unimportant. Like the more you do this stuff, the less important the software becomes. It, it really is the truth. All right. I'm going to dive into Blender and actually start doing something doing doing some blendering let's see i've got uh what was i gonna do okay yeah this is what i'm this is what i'm gonna do uh this is an image if we take a look at it this is a creative commons cc zero image of a yoga lady uh, striking a a particularly impressive pose i would say so she's on a handstand she's pointing her feet back this is perfect for being a gestural sculpt. I'm just going to start from a sphere, an icosphere, and I'm going to make some rules for myself. I'm going to use only the grab brush, snake hook brush, and the uh, clay strips. That's the big one. Clay strips brush is going to be important for the gestural approach. But uh, what I'm going to end up with is this. All right, so this is an example of a gestural sculpt where I'm just very loosely making strokes that that create the the mass the overall shape and volume but like all these little little uh stray stroke marks like this is fine i'm not refining it i'm just very quickly building up the shapes so that's the goal of of this exercise that i'm doing and i'm, I'm training myself to get better at how to form these shapes gesturally quickly and hopefully it won't take me 45 minutes to do this i mean it should take me like I don't know, 10 minutes to get a decent shape. But if I'm trying to, but if I'm trying to explain stuff, it might take longer. Um. <laughs> Strike a reference pose. Oh man, I don't know. I kind of need my full body. Uh, I don't know, but I don't have muscles to show off. Um, I, yeah, if I don't have reference, I'm not a good like um, on the spot poser, I suppose. But I uh, hope I don't disappoint too much. Getting my second donut to watch Kent's demo. <laughs> Man, enjoy that donut for me, please. All right, gestural sculpting. Let's get going. I'm going to start with an icosphere on this blank. I'm just going to delete that, actually create a new one. Icosphere. And we're going to change the subdivisions up. Let's go to subdivision of four. I found that four tends to be where I like to be. Let's get rid of that timeline just to gain a little bit more real estate. I'm going to tab into edit mode and move all my verts up. Again, that's just my that's just my preference. I don't like things. I like to treat the grid as a ground plane. So that's what I'm doing. I'm preparing for that. And we're going to tab into, well, not tab. We're going to just select sculpt mode. And first things first. Again, I'm trying to, the idea here is to go fast, but is to learn how to build up shapes fast because that's going to train us to interpret shapes quicker as well. Um, and I also should say this, if you're like me, when I, with the sculpting process is like threefold to me. There, stage one is like block out, you know, getting something from nothing, a base sculpture from nothing. Step two is refining that to to not a detailed version, but just a very good base version, like 50% of the sculpture, that's stage two. And then stage three is 
refining all of the details, adding your fine details. That's what stage three is all about. So I enjoy stage two and stage three, but stage one is annoying. Getting, getting things started from scratch. Um, I, I'm just impatient during that time. I want to get something that I like as fast as possible. And that's where gestural sculpting will really help. Um, uh, it's just like die, I, get, I get straight into the sculpt mode and I just start creating and, and roughing out the shape. So I want to be better at that and that's why I'm spending time doing this. Um, I'm going to grab my, I'm going to use my snake hook brush and immediately, I guess this sphere I'm kind of imagining as the like top of the torso right here. So I'm going to first drag out some arms um, for her to balance on. And uh, let's see, I'm going to enable dynamic topology. Subdivide collapse looks good. Resolution. Let's see here. I'm going to try constant detail. No, I'm going to start off with relative detail, which is the, de which is the default at level 10. Um, options. I don't need that. Symmetry. I want to sculpt symmetrically in the X initially for the arms to be symmetrical, the head to be symmetrical, and then the torso to be symmetrical. And then we're going to have to break the symmetry with the legs. So with my steak hook brush, let's just start. Um, I need to change the curve. I need to grab the arms, just grab some parts of the mesh to be arms. And with the grab brush, I'm just roughing out this initial form, trying to make this into a torso. You can see how it, you know, it starts at the arm region and then it kind of slants forward or slants backward in Y and then slants uh, upward. So you have this kind of shape in the torso. And then the head can just start to bring that shape out. All right, so we've, we've got it started from the side. I think I need to bring everything up a little bit. Let's do that with the grab brush. So I only have one reference here and it's this angle. And so that's what's gonna be my governing angle. I really wanna make sure that it looks right in that angle, but then also not neglect the rest of the sculpture and how it looks from various angles. I just wanna be mindful of that. Let's see, maybe inflate the head using, oh, I'm not gonna use the inflate brush. I'm gonna use clay strips, all right? That's gonna be my main brush once I get you know my general form started. I'm gonna build up that volume with clay strips because the head needs to be much, much wider. All right, just with one brush, now we've got the basics of a head. Holding control, I can limit I can like shrink down the neck, maybe build it back up a little bit. But using the clay strips forces you to to uh, sculpt gesturally, I guess. Like you'll 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 think about shaping in a different way. All right, so I'm kind of building up the deltoid. Is that what that is? Deltoid, I believe. <laughs> Not very good with the names names of muscles. All right, but it's it's not really about that right now. We're just trying to match what we see in the artwork, right? So the shoulder was just simply too thick. So holding control, I'll just trim it down. I mean, it's as simple as that. Let's see, an elbow typically has like a point to it. So I can just build out that little spot. All right, we've got a little bit of an elbow started. This muscle in the forearm kind of curls around the head or the, the, the arm shape. And so I'm learning how to do creases, which is a little different. Like, you know, trying to sculpt this divot with just the, the um, clay strips brush is kind of you, is, is different than I would usually do it. And that's just gonna be, I think that's healthy to learn a different perspective. This clay strips is your favorite brush. You use it 8% of the time. It is one of those brushes that once you learn it and you're comfortable with it, it becomes a go-to for sure. 
Can you block out with meta balls? You definitely can block out with meta balls. It's not something I've ever done, but I've seen people do it. Um, so you can. If you want to pursue that, absolutely give it a shot. All right. So I've got the forearm started, but I clearly don't have enough geometry. So let's go back to the snake hook brush. You know, just, just training your eye to zoom out and realize, like, take quick measurements in your mind's eye, right? So the from shoulder to elbow, how is that in comparison to the size of the head? I actually think it's pretty close, but the forearm needs a lot more. Needs, needs more, not like a ton more. Whoops, I got rid of all that detail. All right, so we've lengthened the forearm more appropriately. Now I'm going to kind of pull this mass out to create like a hand. All right, so we've got a little hand shape started. I'm, just, I'm not going to sculpt the individual fingers. I'm just pulling out general shape. Still not big enough. Little nubby thumbs. I don't want them to be touching, but I do need them to be bigger. Go back to clay strips. There we go. Build up the build up those shapes a little bit more. But I, you know, we don't need to be too detailed. Does it read to me as like a hand is a hand esque shape? Yeah, I think that's good enough. The arms are could use a little bit more effort or a little bit more time. Oh my gosh, the shoulders! Look how thin they are. No one's shoulders are that thin. So let's use the grab brush. Grab over snake hook so that the geometry is not auto generated. Uh, it's making it tough because of symmetry. Okay, the reason this isn't working very well is because it's there's symmetry happening. So let me turn off symmetry for right now. Move my I'm just going to focus on this this arm on the on my visual right side, her left arm and start moving that out. It's maybe a little bit too far. But I'm just focusing on the one side. And then I can go to uh, dynamic topology, symmetrize, positive X to negative X. There we go. All right, so at least my shoulders are more appropriately wide. I can jump back to clay strips and continue refining those shapes because the neck got all wonky. Oh, I need to re-enable symmetry. Okay, back to clay strips. Let's. My shapes are getting a little out of whack. Need to build up the front of the neck. And I did seem to pull out the shoulders maybe a little bit too much. No, maybe not. So if I want to crease right here, you know, for the in, inside the shoulder, that's definitely going to be a tight crease. And I'm going to to do that with a clay strips brush. I'm going to cut away first. It's going to leave this ugly like like chasm. But if I build up on just the one side, now we start to get more of a, uh, a crease shape. So that's how to hack that. All right, let's move on to some of the rest of our, our body shapes. I want to, you know, it, this will always look a little bit weird by itself until we get the context of the legs being in there as well. So let's use snake hook. She's a little bit too skinny, unnaturally skinny. Let's uh, build this pelvis area back up with the clay strips. It's just gotten a little too thin. J 
just trying to make it like a general mass right now. And then I'll start grabbing uh, legs and moving them out. Question, do you remember the article you wrote a long time ago because of a lady that sold her unmade bed as an art and got paid $5 million for it? How about a stream of what counts as art? Um, <clears throat> I could definitely go on about that. It would probably be more of a rant rather than, I don't know how educational it would be. Um, I don't know how many people want to see me rant about that kind of thing. But um, yes, I do remember that that article. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Um, grab my mouse for this. But yeah, I remember seeing that article. And, and I've historically struggled with modern art. I, I think I've matured in recent years, but in the beginning really struggled with modern art. I mean, as a computer graphics artist, when you spend years trying to understand realism and authenticity to reality, and you see people like butchering that stuff and calling it art, butchering that stuff and calling it art. Um, you know, I got that, that I found offensive or whatever, but um, I've learned to appreciate it more, even though I still think there is, you know, there needs to be some rules around it. Anyway, I don't want to get into that too much, but let, let me find if that blog post still is there. Art. It's an old one, so it might have evaded our like updating pass. Wait a minute. Really? Oh, what is art? Here it is. Yeah, so that's the article. I can post that in the chat if anybody's interested. But yeah, that's from 2014. But yeah, it just it's a challenge to like consider what art is, consider like the the consequences if there are no rules around art, but also the consequences of too many rules, too many strict rules. So yeah, it's kind of lost its formatting. It's a pretty old article, bummer. But check it out if you want to know about that. I could do a stream about it. I could definitely go on about that stuff for a while. I'll put it in the idea bank. All right, so back to sculpting. I'm going to grab the snake hook brush. We've got our mass down here around the hips. And we can start, um, speaking of the hips, you know, you, you may have noticed that I like widened the hips, kind of shrunk the, the, the abdomen area, like the side of the, of the abdomen, because that's kind of general female form, you know, wider hips, kind of hourglass shape. And that's just kind of a general rule that I understand about like women, you know, have that shape compared to men have more of a triangular wide shoulders, narrowing hips, um, but that's why I made that decision. I'm not necessarily getting that information from the artwork, but as you sculpt, you'll start to pick up tips, you know, uh, rules to keep in mind. All right, so I'm going to drag out a leg. Whoops, I want to turn off symmetry. Snake hook brush makes this very easy. Again, I'm just ballparking the length from the, the hip to the knee. And now pulling back the rest, the, the, the lower part of the leg. And there we go. Snake hook brush makes it very easy to like create that silhouette. Like that happened really, really quick, but it looks terrible from other angles. Like really, really bad from other angles. So I need to keep that in mind. Let's use the clay strips brush to build up this foot. Hopefully it's not too thin. If it's too thin, you can see that it's gonna, it's always gonna be, uh, yeah, that's a problem. So I can't actually use the clay strips on a mesh that thin. So I need to use the eye inflate brush to build that up first and just get a, a bigger thickness. And then I'll go back to the uh, clay strips. So I had to break my rule, but it's all right, just for uh, necessity, not not out of necessarily choice. Clay strips, all right. So we wanna build up, I mean, this leg is looking really, really wonky. So it needs to be much straighter. Maybe inflate it up a little bit more. Yeah, so I guess I'm having to use the inflate brush just for momentary time let 
Let's see if I can pick up any information. Like, where should this foot be placed? I feel like it should angle in a little bit more. All right, that feels better. All right, let's build up some, some uh, foot anatomy. Build up a heel. Build up like a sole, the outside of the foot, toes. Just using the clay strips brush to kind of build these shapes up. All right, it's gradually getting there. The foot is overall kind of lopsided. But this shape gives us, I mean, this tells us a lot. You know, it's a flat foot. You also have your own feet to look at, you know, if you ever have questions about anatomy. It's the good thing about modeling humans is we have unlimited reference for ourselves. But you can see with the foot how we have this sort of ridge in the middle. Right here, we've got this ridge, and then it tapers down real thin. There we go. So I'm not being overly precise. I'm just getting it close. That's the beauty of gestural sculpting. It's not big enough. Her foot's too small. I'm using the grab brush too much. I would much, it's much more, I think the clay strips brush actually works better sometimes than the, uh, than even the grab brush. Building up the, the bone, your ankle bone. All right, build up the calves. Now, because her leg is so uh, bent, like the calves are going to, the muscles around the calves are going to like compress together and then push outside. Like they, the, the volume needs somewhere to go, like a balloon. So I'm going to make sure to concentrate a lot of volume on the outside of the calves. And same thing a little bit with the thighs. Whoa. All right, so let's build up the thigh a bit better. And then the knee. All right, we're getting somewhere. Slower than I would have liked, but... Uh, Ah, oh, well. All right, let's, how about that other leg? All right, we're just gonna grab it and bring it out pretty straight. Make a mental like measurement and it looks like it needs to come out a little bit further. Something like that for the final final length and but it, it's way off kilter I don't think her legs facing that far off to the left so let's grab it move it back uh, it's gonna get really really messed up that's another part uh, so part of the issue there is the curve with my grab brush remember I told you I like to move that point closer to the corner it doesn't solve it completely, but it does make it
better. Oh, I think I'm missing some questions. Sorry, I got a little lost in my work. Question, when I use the snake hook for Melvin's teeth, I had to pull a lot of times to get even a little bit of teeth. How do you make it so that you can pinch uh, so much at the same time? So it has to do with your curve and your, um, your strength. I imagine maybe in your... Uh, Let's see. In your brush, you're, you have you don't have unified strength enabled, which I don't either. So I need to enable that. Um, because you know, with the unified, without unified strength enabled, you can use your clay strips brush really strong, and then shift over to snake hook. But that's really low in its strength, and you can feel like why is it not doing much? But it's because you probably expected the strength to be high from your clay strips brush. So I just recommend turning that on, in uh, unified strength. And your snake hook brush needs to be at, you know, like a higher strength. If, I, if it's at a low strength, you'll get that kind of effect where it's barely coming out. All right, the pose of that leg looks better, but it got really messed up along the way. All right, clay strips brush. I think that's gonna be thick enough to start using that. Build up a thigh, muscle mass. Also try to get the leg back to being round. You know, if you look at the profile, like it's really lopsided. The, the, the profile of the leg is more like this when I want it to be, you know, round for the most part. So that's something to keep in mind. I see a lot of new sculptors not really be mindful of the of the profile. It can, and it can lead to some pretty ugly issues, issues. All right, building up the calf. What's nice about the leg is how really not straight it is. Like the actual shape kind of has a very subtle S curve to it. Those shapes are really important to get right. Um, and so building up the thigh on this top side and then building up the calf on the bottom side, that's going to help. Yikes, I might not have enough. No, I do. And really forcing yourself, forcing myself to use this clay strips brush. Again, like it's weird, but like it, it just does something for understanding the shape in a new way. That's, that's very beneficial. And then there's usually the, uh, the bone in your calf or not in, in your, uh, shin, like the shin bone that is kind of straight. That's going to be good to have in there kind of make a stroke down the middle the knee area is a little too thin oh wow so clay strips brush not working great in that situation let's just plump it out with the inflate brush All right, that's starting to look pretty good. We have reasonable anatomy in there. None of it's perfect. That's the that's the nice thing about gestural sculpting is perfection is not on the table. We're just trying to get it in the ballpark. All right, so I've got the leg sculpted, but I need the foot. Clip back to the snake hook brush. So skinny. All 
All right, I might have to use, since this is such a thin shape, I'll probably have to use inflate. Maybe I can get away with the clay strips. Does anyone find this gestural sculpting interesting? Press one if you feel like you could get into gestural sculpting and adopt it as like a method for maybe getting more familiar with the human body in general or just like experimenting with a new type of sculpting. But yeah, press one if you are interested in gestural sculpting based off this, if it's your first time seeing it. Nice. Wilco might give it a shot. I think it really is good for learning the human form. Um, just forcing yourself to like create the shapes very fast. And what and like the familiarity with the human body can take you a long way. Like I'm not really studying her body in the in the photo for hardly any of the any of these foot details. It's just like you have your own feet. You know, I can look at my bare feet right now and, and get a good idea. You know, legs, stuff like that. Cool. Okay, I see some ones. I like it for blocking. Yeah, and being able to refine this afterwards is... Uh, wow, her leg's actually huge. That last leg is a little too big. No big deal. Just pull it back with the grab brush foot in general is a little too big. Maybe pinch it. How about that? With uh, subdivide edges on. There we go. I think that's proportioned a little bit better. Yikes. The inside of the foot's looking weird. Awesome. I'm glad to see you guys might be into it. It seems fun in a fast sculpting, like fast drawing. Exactly. It's almost like sketching for sculptures. Um, but yeah, it is. Like if you if you practice this and, you know, you're welcome to practice this and do if do a few gestural sculpts for week four homework, if you'd like. It's not required by any means, but like if you if the the more you do it, the better you'll get. And I do want to show you something before we stop. Um, I'm not trying to be overly anatomical right now with the posterior, but there definitely needs to be some effort in that area. We can see in the art that like the compression on on the glutes tends to make it like you know push out a little bit just like the calf muscle but then on this one it doesn't puff out as much as it contracts and gets you know pretty like, tight there we go we're, we're making good progress let's compare it to the one i did earlier Nice, that's actually really close. Sweet. So I guess I could maybe try to start a new one. Here's something I wanted to tell you about. If you go to, if you want to get into gestural sculpting the way I do, I'm going to try, I'm going to see if I can commit the time to, um, what do you call it? Uh, like a pose generator. 
I was looking at this up earlier. This one looked pretty good. So what this does is just like puts a random picture. That's kind of an odd one to start out with maybe. Um, let's start with it. Let's go to the next one. So you can like sculpt these, right? Like you can just, you can time it. The next pose in 25 seconds, we can change that time to like, let's say 10 minutes, limit yourself to 10 minutes per sculpture, sculpt it, do a gestural sculpt, and then it'll switch after 10 minutes and you'll go on to another one. Um, so I think that these are, I think that these are clothes. I don't think there are any nude ones in here, but there are, there are an underwear. It's just for, you know, form shaping. Let's see what else they got. <laughs> Some of these are really funny. But, you know, once you giggle at the pose a little bit, you actually learn a lot by sculpting them rapidly. So um, I would recommend finding a pose generator that you like. And uh, this one would be great. Yeah, but it can be really fun and really, really familiarize yourself with the human body um, if you're able to commit to that. Cat worship. <laughs> well, thank you, Miranda. That's very kind of you. Cool. Well, maybe I'll find, um, maybe I'll, maybe I will look at another, let me find another image. Um, I'm going to find a CC zero image. Let's see. What should we find? Uh, how about another yoga pose? Oh, look at these. Yoga poses are something, there's the one that I used earlier. This one would be good for symmetry, so maybe I can do that one. Uh, it kind of looks like the one I already did. What about this one? How about this one? That's just a silhouette. This one's pretty wild. No, 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 the classic, this one. Let's do the classic one. All right, I'm just gonna move this off to the side so I can see it, you won't be able to see it. No, I'll, I'll save it and put it in Blender, Never mind. Sorry, give me a moment. I wasn't, I didn't know that I would finish that necessarily. Image. Oh, I forgot where I was saving these. Desktop. All right, let's try this. Open desktop. All right, let's try and sculpt this. It's fairly symmetrical. The lotus pose, fighting, oh, a fighting pose? Do we wanna see that? A cartoonist pose, okay. Man, I, sorry, I didn't even look at the, I didn't look at the suggestions. Okay, let's go back. So I need it to be CC zero, typically. Um, let's see. Oops, wow. Let's see if there's any good cartoon poses. Huh, these are kind of interesting. Yeah, not great on the cartoon side. They're not just, they're not that high quality, I guess. That one could be kind of good. But I like these poses. These seem pretty high quality, at least this middle one especially. Contoured contortionist can you tag someone in the comments yes dragon ice all you have to do is do the at symbol and then the username so the way that you do that is um so dragon ice if you can see if i hover over one of your usernames or one of your display names in the bottom left i'm using chrome in the bottom left of Chrome, it'll show the uh, 
the um, URL to your page, which is, which the last part of it is, uh, this is not a great way to explain it. If I, okay, hover over your name, right click, copy link address, paste that, and the last part after the slash is the username. All right, so delete everything but the username, put the at symbol in front of it, and that's how you can mention people. It, we're gonna we're gonna make it much more intuitive, but currently that's how you like hack it. Okay, cool. I'm gonna yeah, I'll sculpt this one right here, real quick. Cartoony pose. You don't have to just do yoga or or like realistic human poses. All right, let's try that one. Got about 10 minutes. Can I do it? Can I do it? Doesn't help that she's on a white background, does it? All right. Let's create a new layer. Shift, well, let's first add a icosphere at level four. Perfect. Hit M to move it to a new uh, collection. I called it a layer, didn't I? New collection, sketch, underscore three. Okay. Same situation, I'm gonna move it up. I think I'm gonna move, oh, it does have UVs, look at that. Why in the world does it have built-in UVs? Has it always been that way? I didn't think any of the primitives had built-in UVs. Interesting. I like this pose in the middle. It's got it's got good action, good flow. So I'm gonna make this sphere be sort of the the, the uh, pelvis region, and then we'll start from there. I'm gonna jump into sculpt mode. <laughs> Um, snake hook. All right, we're not going to be able to, let's see. I think I can use a little bit of symmetry. I'm going to say that these legs are going to be close to symmetrical, maybe even completely symmetrical, but the angle at which we're looking at the character is going to be like off, you know, three quarters. So let's enable symmetry, subdivide collapse, Enable X symmetry and let's start, let's see how far we can get symmetrical. To whoever was asking about symmetry, now you can see just how, how much I try and lean on it. Work smarter, not harder kind of thing. Wow, these are skinny legs. Let's blow them up with the inflate brush. snake hook to drag out the um, the toes. I like that she's not touching the ground. She's like hovering over it. It's kind of an interesting little part of the pose. Let's see. I'm going to use a snake hook to generally rough out the rest of the, of the torso pose. See if I'm looking at it from this angle, her torso comes forward and then back up like this. All right, let's start with that. Take down the clay strips. Start to rough in the anatomy a bit better. You know, like get some glutes. Get some general, you know, skinnier waist kind of thing. need a lot less at the top. Being a cartoon, like her legs are really, really long, but her torso is very, very short. That's kind of classic Disney style character. All right. build up the like leg shapes a bit better.
Ugh, that's looking bad. <laughs> that's so bad. I don't like to use the smooth brush that much because we lose that gestural type um, stroke pattern all over the surface, which I like. I think it, it does a lot for the, the style. I have a long ways to go both in the pose, but also in achieving the, uh, the cartoony aspect. Because I do want the style to sort of ring true. So we've got big, you know, round, thick thighs, and then, you know, small joints. Question, do you always have to have to do human anatomy for gestural sculpting or can it be also be an animal? Absolutely an animal. Uh, now that you mentioned that, when I was preparing, I did mean to grab a dog pose. I have one now that I remember. I have a dog pose save that I was going to use. So it doesn't have to be human, not at all. Totally do animals, um, trees if you want. Like, yeah, you can do anything you want. It's about it's about learning how to sculpt, not not so much what you're sculpting. If you're obviously, if you're into characters, like human human anatomy makes the most sense to pursue. Um, like you definitely want to be good at that if you're trying to be a character artist. Characters is a big thing that I'm into, so naturally I kind of went towards the human place. But but yeah, I mean I I should have done the dog. Now that I'm thinking about it, because you've already seen all these shapes. Yeah, that was a missed opportunity. I'm bummed about that now. I wish I had done the dog. What was I thinking? But hopefully from this you'll be able to see that I can go faster maybe. Since I just sculpted this, I should be able to achieve all these same shapes much quicker. All right, that's not too bad. It's a little masculine maybe, but I feel like I'm getting somewhat close to the pose. They do look sort of like man legs. <laughs> Maybe I can like widen, emphasize like the hips a bit. Let's see, I'm kind of running out of time, but maybe I can get the arms in there. These are not symmetrical, so let's turn symmetry off. They're really skinny arms, aren't they? Maybe I should also go down to five. That'll help, so I can actually pull out the arms and have enough geometry. Ah, this is an interesting issue. I think I need to mask. Control I to invert. Snake hook brush. Let's first before I snake hook brush, I'm going to inflate the nub just so I have a little bit more mass with which to pull the snake hook out of. Ah, weird. This is kind of a hard shape to do gesturally. Let's go back to the size of 10. Getting a little too detailed too, or too much geometry too quick. Let's clay strips and uh, uh, carve that down a bit.
What is this? Oh, it's the thumb brush. That thumb brush, my eternal enemy. Whew, she's got, she's got some muscles on this right arm, doesn't she? That was a pretty hard shape to do gesturally. Need to keep that in mind. Let's see here. Let's go back to my clay strips and try and carve down her shoulders a bit better. Right now it's this enormous mass, way too much geometry, way, way too much volume. Sorry, I'm getting quiet. Um, just trying to address her chest and achieve this shoulder shape a bit better. Anyway, I'm kind of running out of time, but I got, I got, I feel like I progressed much faster with this, with this gestural sculpt. So you can see where it was going. We were getting fairly close. Save that just in case I want to keep it. But yeah, we have our headless little cartoon right here. What is that sound? Could you hear? So yeah, I do have a fan going on. Uh, I'm sorry if... I mean, it's been on the whole time. So I, I don't know what made you just hear it. But yeah, it's pretty hot. It gets pretty hot in here when I stream. Let's see. The thumb brush is evil. Question, is it better to specialize or to be more broad? At what point um, when learning do you think it's good to specialize? So that's a good question, a pretty big one. If you want to go professional and, and be hired at like a Pixar or a Blizzard, um, DreamWorks, like the bigger studios, specialization is kind of the standard now. Uh, when computer graphics was young and it was kind of a new art form, a new industry, like we needed generalists. It needed generalists, people who could do everything. But now there are so many more people involved. The art has matured. The, the pipeline has matured. And so people like hire, you'll, you'll rarely see jobs for like generalists, especially at those big places. You know, smaller studios still hire generalists, but like it's you, it's mostly specialized at the big places, just a modeler or just an environment modeler, even a, a character modeler, even um, very specific, a, a rigger only VFX artist only animator only. Um, it's more specialized in the, in the professional industry. Um, for me personally, I find that I want to keep my hands and fingers in, in everything because I like to see my characters animated. I like to see, uh, my character's textured and shaded, and so I have to be able to learn those things in order to to make satisfying personal projects. Um, but when I applied to to get a job, I applied as a character artist, even though I had materials, uh, textures lit and rendered. I still applied as a character artist. So that um, that was specialized. That's the general consensus. Uh, but for myself, I still like to be informed of the other techniques because it makes more a fuller picture in my projects. Um, 
because computer graphics is such a big field, it's hard to do everything really, really, really well. Very, very difficult to do everything super well. Did I miss any other questions? But yeah, I think that uh, what Miranda said... Question, if you want to rig this character, would the next step uh, after sculpting be to retopologize? Yes. Uh, I like to sculpt my characters to about 50 to 75% of their final detail level and then retopologize uh, for animation. And then if I want, I can add more sculpted detail as a multi-res modifier onto that nice geometry. But yeah, for pretty much like you're just not going to be able to to animate this kind of geometry very well. That's just not like kosher. That's not really, uh, that's just not good practice. Um, unreliable for optimization, you know, rigging a lower, op a lower resolution mesh that's more optimized. That's good for animation because you can play back in real speed. Um, it's, be it be it's better for deformation. You know, you can, you have fewer points to control the, the deformation, but um, in general, yeah, this is just kind of throwaway geometry uh, for sculpting. Awesome. Okay, well, that's about it. I've kept you for two hours now. Yeah, so I'm going to continue with this. I'm probably going to try with the, the gestural sculpting. I'm going to try and record a tutorial soon about it in a more, like, uh, concise teacher, teacher kind of way. This was more exploratory. Uh, I hope you guys learned some things. I hope it was helpful to, to like clarify your mindset on how to progress as a, as a blender artist, a blender modeler, especially. But um, I look very forward to seeing what you do this week. Uh, please impress me, you know, challenge yourself, show me that you're challenging yourself and be inspired. Like if you don't have, if you don't know what you're going to do in week four, uh, go, go, go to art station, find something that's cool. Go to Pinterest, find some sort of artwork, look, search 2d concepts or something and, um, be inspired. Something that gets you excited that you want to see created and try it. Um, but I want you to be challenged and you to be your own motivation, you know, primarily this, this week. So awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Always a pleasure hanging out with you. And uh, we will have another stream next week. It's the class wrap stream where we'll, it's very, very relaxed where we'll go over homework like we usually do. Answer any last minute questions that you have before uh, we close out the class officially. But there will be no homework next week. Just the, the final stream. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, wrapping up the class, uh, ending on a strong note with all of you. And I will see you in the class thread. So thank you. Have a great day.